And this triggered me into going around knocking on doors of priest houses and, uh, and convents uh, in the eastern townships. I spent uh, days in Maryland with me, with her picture, looking to see if anyone had seen her. The family hired a private detective. They called in the Lennoxville police who jumped to the conclusion Teresa was a runaway who would eventually come back. Another misstep. Like Champlain College, the police didn't appear to take Teresa's disappearance seriously. Michael Benazon was teaching English at Champlain College that year. He thought something should have been done. Well, I went to um, one of the Champlain officials and suggested that we have a search. This was uh, within a few days of the disappearance. Uh, if it had been organized by the police with the cooperation of the campus, there's no reason why we couldn't have had a well-organized search with 3,000 people combing those fields. According to Benazon, the suggestion was shrugged off. It struck me as um, irresponsible not to do that. I don't know that it was, um, I don't know who's, uh, on whose authority it was decided not to uh, do that, uh, whether it was the police or the uh, authorities at the college or whatever, uh, I don't know. But why wouldn't the college raise the alarm for a missing student? The reputation of the college uh, might be at stake because that could lead to questions about how the um, uh, residence was uh, managed. Teresa had vanished into thin air. As the weeks and months went by, the rumors circulated. She was back in Montreal. She was in the United States somewhere. As it turns out, Teresa was not far away. Throughout the winter, her body lay here in a wooded area, dumped in the river, just about a couple of kilometers away from the Compton residence where she lived. Nobody knew she was here because nobody was looking for her. As incredible as it seems, neither the police nor the school mounted an all-out search for a missing 19-year-old girl. When we return, first I didn't believe it was a body, I thought it's a mannequin or something. How this man finally found Teresa and what police insist must have caused her death. There is no way that students could mastermind some kind of massive cover-up like this without anybody knowing about it. It's absolutely impossible. When CTV's W5 continues. Still to come, how a missing student was finally found. It's a creepy area. And why police believed her classmates conspired to cover up the truth. They wanted to prove their own theory. When CTV's W5 continues. Robert Ride knows the lay of the land in Quebec's eastern townships like the back of his hand. He will never forget the Easter weekend of 1979 when he walked down to the edge of the Coda Cook River. I was uh, doing a bit of muskrat trapping at the time, spring muskrat trapping. I uh, had a long weekend. It was the morning of Good Friday. I was just basically looking for a muskrat sign in the, in the water when I came upon the the body. It was April 13th, five months after Teresa Allure vanished. The muskrat trapper had accidentally stumbled across her body, face down, clad only in a bra and a pair of panties, in a muddy creek under a bridge that is barely two kilometers down a country road from the village of Compton and the Champlain student residence. First, I didn't think it was, you know, I didn't believe it was a body. I thought it was a mannequin or something. But... When I got close enough to it, I realized it was, was really a body. Although it's directly off a secondary route, this is an isolated spot during the day. On a November night, it would have been virtually deserted. In the nearby farmer's field, police found a torn scarf, later identified as a 19th birthday gift to Teresa, but nothing else. Then, a week later, an unexpected twist. A farmer spotted Teresa's wallet in the ditch along this country road, 10 kilometers from where her body was found. Inside, the markers of a teenager's life, her college student cards, a gum wrapper, a picture of a boy. 
At first, a local coroner thought he saw signs of strangulation. But the autopsy report shows no obvious marks of violence, no evidence of sexual assault. After five months in the water, medical examiners could not say exactly how or when Teresa died, except that it was a violent death of an undetermined nature. A complete mystery. Leo Hamel was the Lenoxville police chief back in 1978. He retired long ago, but after all these years, he still has his file on the missing girl. Why are you holding on to all of this, Leo? I don't know. Look at all these clippings. The former chief is still affected by the disappearance and death of a young student in the community he was sworn to protect. He was a small town chief with a lot on his plate. But Amal insists that back in 1978, he did everything he could to try and find Teresa. There was no ground search because, in the beginning, he honestly believed she would show up. I thought that she went to Montreal and she stayed with some friend and decided not to come back, uh, take a time off for uh, a week or so, you know. A search wouldn't have saved Teresa, but finding her earlier might have provided police with more clues and spurred an investigation. Months before her body was found, the former police chief recalls a curious incident. Two hunters reported seeing a neatly folded pile of women's clothing in a forest the same weekend Teresa disappeared. And then we went in the woods with those two hunters, and we never been able to find the clothes. Did you think it was connected in some way? I thought it was connected. You thought it might be Teresa's yeah. clothing? Yes. The Lennoxville chief notified the Quebec Provincial Police, the Sûreté de Quebec, about the missing girl. Teresa's parents were shocked when an officer named Rock Goudreau told them to stop searching for their daughter. And what exactly did he say to you? He said that he didn't believe that we should be wasting our time like that. We should go home from where we came from and that she would come out of the snowbank in the spring and that's exactly what he said. The Surete investigator had come up with a theory. There had been a party in the residence the night Teresa disappeared involving LSD. Perhaps she took some and accidentally overdosed. After all, it was the late 70s, a permissive time when kids were experimenting with drugs. But the Lenoxville police had already looked into that. Everyone at the party said Teresa wasn't there. You considered the possibility that drugs were involved in Teresa's death? Yes. But she was not a drug addict, as far as you know. No, 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 she was not a drug addict. She smoked marijuana, just like most of the kids at that place did, but as far as I know, she did not do anything, take any other drugs than that. She smoked cigarettes. Even after she was found face down, half naked under this bridge, the SQ continued to hold on to the theory that Teresa Allure had probably overdosed. Then, frightened students covered it up. And that's crazy. Champlain, you couldn't kiss a boy on Friday night without the entire campus knowing about it on Saturday morning. There is no way that students could mastermind some kind of massive cover-up like this without anybody knowing about it. It's absolutely impossible. Former teacher Michael Benazon, too, scoffs at that theory, saying the students were young, immature, but not vicious. And if one of them uh, might have been like that, the others uh, would have uh, um, told about it, would have said something, and they didn't. And there's a reason why they didn't. It's because it didn't happen. But what did happen to Teresa? The months and years dragged on and the case remained unsolved. Her family had lost their only daughter. They were left with a void that could never be filled. You know, it's like uh, uh, you're a hole and uh, then a slice is taken away. And um, you just learn to live with that. Her family also struggled with the shame of the drug overdose theory. The idea